Center for Genomic Gastronomy. How may I help you? How much smog do I eat every year? How does smog affect my taste buds? Does smog change the flavor of street food? Well, a lot of people seem very concerned about smog and how it affects what they eat. I guess I'll send it over to the uh, investigators. Taking questions from concerned citizens, genomic gastronomy investigators are tasked with researching culinary controversies around the world. GGI uncover and reveal the strange but true stories of our global food system. Do you know what's in your food? We've been working on this idea of tasting air pollution or tasting smog for three years now. And the video you're seeing up here is the very first time that we came up with this idea. We were running a workshop with students in Bangalore, India at a school called Shrishti School of Art, Design, and Technology. And in our workshop, we were as a class reading Harold McGee's sort of classic book on food and cooking. And there's this amazing quote where he's talking about egg meringues. And he says, when you're whipping the meringue, it gets bigger and bigger, and you're harvesting the air. We're really struck by this metaphor. Well, if you're harvesting the air, and the air is really polluted, then you're being able to taste pollution or tasting smog. So with our students, we went out and shot this short video. It's not always practical to go out in a city and collect lots of air pollution in such a direct way. And if the air is really polluted, you want to be a bit thinking about people's health. Um, and so what we started thinking was, if we take air quality data, from the World Bank, we could convert it into recipes. So what you see in front of you are um, recipes that simulate the smog from different cities. So we have Mexico City, uh, we have Rotterdam, and we have uh, Delhi. And I'll invite you to taste some of these, and I believe we have even more in the back. If you love them, you can have some more. We have a smog outfit here, which is a vest that uh, folds up. So this is its uh, everyday position. And then when they go out into the polluted areas, it can uh, snap up like this. Functions as a filter to kind of filter out the air that's going through um, as they're collecting this polluted air to make into a meringue. And then uh, to accompany that, we have this smog tasting uh, maker kit, which all come, becomes one an, um, an orb like this that can be carried, but contains a bowl for making the meringue, all the um, food items that you need, and then a little cooker so that you can cook your little meringue on site, this little guy, and produce uh, a beautiful smog tasting uh, wherever you are in the world. Center for Genomic Gastronomy, how may I help you? Good evening, I have a burning question. What are mutation bred foods? What are mutation bred foods? Hmm. Are mutagenic foods the same as GMOs? What is a gamma garden? Hmm. There seems to be a lot of questions about mutation breeding and gamma gardens. I think it's time we turned it over to the investigators. We started reading about mutation breeding, and uh, we were listening to a podcast by an African scientist who was doing mutation breeding, and I misheard his accent. He said cobalt-60 source, and he meant a radiation source, and I heard cobalt-60 sauce, and thought, oh, we should make that. Uh, so that was kind of the impetus, and as we looked more into this topic of mutation breeding, it's something that we really had never heard about in, in our collective. Um, and so the basic story is that um, after World War II, the US and, and its allies were looking to find peaceful uses of, radiation, of uh, uh, radioactive technology, radiation technology. Um, and on the one hand, a lot of people were freaking out, saying uh, an atom bomb was just dropped. This is the most destructive technology ever. How can you ever think of using this? And other people were saying, no, this is the future. This is what's going to save humanity, right? We'll end starvation. We'll have endless amounts of energy. And so the symbol here is the Atoms for Peace symbol. This was the US program, but there were allied programs all over Europe. Um, and you see that radiation was going to be used for 
science and medicine, agriculture and industry. And one of the first uses was for uh, crop, changing crops and crop breeding programs. Uh, and so this is a gamma garden. What, what happened is in the center of this garden was a radioactive source, sometimes cobalt-60, and there's a bunch of plants uh, planted in a circle. The scientists would leave the field, I hope, so as not to be exposed to radiation. Uh, the, a tube with the source would uh, pull up. All the plants closest to the radioactive source would die, and those furthest apart on the outside rings would be less affected or not affected at all. But in that sort of sweet spot in the middle, there was all these mutations. And scientists would then go through and say, oh, that one looks bigger, that one looks more green. And they would um, breed those plants. And this is just an infographic from the New York Times showing sort of the range of mutation bred plants around the world. So we got really fascinated about this history and it's really well documented because if you play with radioactive material, you have to file paperwork with the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. So we spent the last two years kind of looking at their database called the Meta Database, looking for ingredients. And we've developed this sauce with some of the ingredients we found. And as an example, we went to the store in Portland, Oregon, where we were living. We bought three grapefruits, and it turns out that two of them were mutation bread. And that was a bit of a surprise. We looked them up. And things like McClellan Scotch, which is a Scotch whiskey, um, uses a barley called uh, Milne's Golden Promise Barley, which was exposed to radiation to mut mutate it. And so there's some barley in this sauce. And I thought something that might be interesting for tonight was to bring up sort of someone we keep running into, I guess you could say a co definitely a colleague, possibly a collaborator, uh, Peter von Bohemen. Yeah, so first of all, yeah, <coughs> uh, artists and scientists, they are actually quite, they have quite a lot in common. Uh, you sometimes would suspect that they're totally different people, but they are actually both researching the world and trying to understand it. And what I see with uh, most scientists in our lab, they're trying to understand how the world works. Uh, and the artists are uh, more asking, like, why are we actually uh, researching this and trying to understand, you know, where does this uh, scientific uh, urge of going to new fields actually come from? So, uh, and what I see in your work is that you're especially uh, investigating biodiversity and uh, our obsession with changing the world. You've, you've, you've shown that picture that we've always been biohackers. Uh, and that's actually, I think, this very nice metaphor. It's the food and uh, biodiversity. And I was in a lab a few weeks ago in, in Leiden with a plant scientist. And uh, then we started to ask him some ethical questions. And he said, ethics? I'm a scientist. I don't know anything about ethics. I'm just making better plants. So, and, and, and like you said, better is culturally constructed, right? So one person's better might be, well, this plant is drought tolerant but actually it has less of this micronutrient. But we don't care in the Netherlands because we have tons of that micronutrient. But if this was to be grown in well, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, it'd be a terrible choice. So, so a lot of those choices are not value neutral. They're, they're culturally embedded and, and they depend on our preferences and values. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, you see that happening, especially when science goes into fields that are not really cultural understanded sta yet like uh, test tube babies or uh, that kind of uh, field. And then, then obviously a lot of problems occur because we don't know how to judge it. Nobody knows whether it's better or worse at all. Uh, and how do you judge that? Uh, uh, hold on. I'm getting a call in on our encrypted line. Center for Genomic Astronomy, how may I help you? Hello. This is Edward Snowden calling. Ah, hi Edward. How's uh, Russia? Russia is fine, but I am looking forward to finally returning to the US one day. There is something I could use your help on. I can't buy Doritos anywhere here. I really miss them. They remind me of home and I always eat them when I'm working. I am wondering if you can help. I'm pretty sure that uh our investigators can rustle up some DIY Doritos. I'll send it over to them. Taking questions. So we have in front of us two colleague, log standing colleagues, um, Selby and Anya, and they do many things, artists, designer and artist. And um, one of the things that they do collectively is help run a space in Amsterdam called De Punt. And in uh, about five weeks ago, we ran the very first Doritos for Snowden a workshop for the video we'd actually love to have a cameo appearance not not a face simulation but but it'd be great if Snowden wanted to to join us for part of the video and do an interview and I think maybe he would agree because there is a real interesting link between what he's inter what he's thinking about for 
data politics and what's happening with food politics. Salbi was the one who sent around this uh, article from the Spiegel, Christian Ströbele. <laughs> he is, uh, I think, a Green Party guy from Germany, and he went to, uh, to Edward Snowden in Moscow, and he asked Edward what he missed the most, and it was Doritos. And um, so I sent it to Zach, and Zach was also thinking about it, and he came up with the idea, well, actually, to, th to thank uh, Edward, we should send him every day a bag of Doritos for at least one year, but maybe the rest of his life. We used uh, the soft uh, mice tortillas and we fried them, and that actually gave a quite good result comparing to the real Doritos. And then we decrypted the flavor. And uh, you can taste the various flavors we made. We actually, tonight we have three flavors. We have one, this is the original, I would say. It is uh, actually, it makes it original because it has the MSG in it, the monosodium glutamate. And the here we have a natural version of that. We uh, didn't use uh, MSG, but we use seaweed and uh, bonito flakes. Uh, that's dolphin, no, that's uh, tuna flake. And we have a very special one, the NSA edition. And that has the ingredients nigella, Szechuan pepper, and asafoetida. And that is something really special, so you definitely should try that. Mm -hmm.